hello, I'm Ed Ludwig for the Dawestown Historical Society, and this is the 18th video interview uh, our society has uh, held. And uh, the purpose of the uh, interview is to preserve the history of Doylestown uh, through the recollections of people who have lived here a long time. Today is uh, October 29, 2010, a, a beautiful fall morning uh, in Doylestown. And we are uh, here in the law office of Tina Mazahari Esquire, our interviewee's daughter on Union Street in Doylestown. The mission of our society is to preserve and commemorate the history of Doylestown, its persons, places, and events, so that they may be long remembered. And one of the important ways we do so is through these video interviews. One of our uh, video guidelines is that the interviewee be at least 75 years old and uh, have special recollections of the community. Uh, having come to Doylestown in 1961, nearly 50 years ago, Dr. Bazahari more than meets that threshold. The title of this interview is Ahmed Mazahari, MD, Doylestown Hospital's first urologist, uh, who also became a prominent member of the Doylestown community. His is a fascinating story of growing up in Iran, then spending a total of more than 10 years in Germany, and then coming to the United States and receiving even more medical training at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He came to Doylestown uh, when our county's medical specialists were few and far between. And as the title of this video states, he was Doylestown Hospital's first urologist. However, he didn't stop there. He became chief of surgery, and he became involved in the community as a dedicated Rotarian and someone who steadfastly supported the improvement of the hospital and Doylestown, and uh, someone who got to know most of the county's official dome on a first name basis. In addition to himself, his family uh, consisted of his wonderful wife, now unfortunately deceased, and uh, their three daughters, two of whom, no doubt for reasons beyond his control, <clears throat> became lawyers. One of them, Tina Mazahari Esquire, has been a longtime member and officer of our society, and she is a well-known uh, lawyer in Doylestown and she will be interviewing her father today. These interviews are filmed by Tully Vision, a company owned and operated by Michelle and Chris Powell, who have become good friends of our society, and we thank them profusely. And now, Ahmed Mazahari, MD, Doylestown Hospital's first urologist, who also became a prominent member of the community. Thank you, Judge Ludwig. My name is Tina Mazahari. I'm the secretary of the Doylestown Historical Society, and it gives me great pleasure to interview my father, Dr. Ahmed Mazahari, today. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank Good. you. Good. Could you tell us a little bit about your childhood? Yeah, I was, I was born at the uh, part of five siblings in a small village outside the Tehran, 10 kilo, 20 kilometers from Tehran. And I grew up in a farm, which my father had a farm. And uh, we, st I started uh, in a, a school up to the fourth grade in another village with 100 
population of 100 people. And uh, there was a one-room schoolhouse which uh, from first to fourth grade and uh, other people, kids come from other villages. The number of uh, people in that class was uh, oh, 20 people in that class. When I finished that fourth grade education up there, we moved to the city of Tehran and continue my high school education. Approximately in, when was that? In, in the year that I moved to Te Tehran was the year of uh, 1940. And from there, I proceed with my high school education in Tehran. And uh, like every youngster, I play soccer for the team. At some point, I become captain of the soccer team at my school. And one of my brother who finished the dental school in Tehran get a scholarship to come to America. And we had a neighbor who was uh, a major uh, under the Shah's army, was a neighbor of us, had uh, good communication, influence on my father, insisted that I should be sent to Europe and to Germany for my medical education. In 1950, I came, came to Germany to start my medical education. I was one of the first medical students at post-war Germany to be admitted to the University of Bonn. Post-World War II? Post-World II, 1950. And was, uh, this Germany at that time was divided in four different zones, was occupied by American and British and Belgian and French forces. And all of that time that I was in Germany, a year and a half I spent in England, continuing my medical education. Then I finished 1956. My medical education came with the insistence of my brother. Now, 1956, I came to America, and uh, I started my internship at Georgetown at that time. I become very interested in American medicine and wanted to remain and continue my, continue my education in medicine in America. I met some officers from the Wall Street Medical Center, and with their help, I joined the American Army in 1957. And from that time, 1957, I was sent back to Germany and at that time, we were stationed at Birch's Garden, which was known at that time. There was uh, Hitler's headquarters, summer headquarters in Birch's Garden. His former summer headquarters? Some former summer headquarters. And knowing the German language, I was uh, some help to our military to translate uh, some of the transcript, which was left in those bunker in Birch's Garden, and trying to help to integrate the German Medical Corps with American Medical Corps. And uh, in 1959, I get married to an Iranian girl by the name of Mehran. And so my, we stayed one year in Germany, then we came in down to America with American military helping me to get my green card came to America in 1961. We came by a trans transportation by a boat. We came a German boat known as Berlin. Took about two weeks on that boat trip to come from La Havre, France, to New York. We came by way of Alice Allen. We were welcome up there, especially since I was in the Army. There were a special reception was given to the people who worked with the American forces in Europe. Well, we had welcome reception up there, and I was set before coming to America that I could continue my residency program at, uni at the hospital of University of Pennsylvania. Then 1961, I started my residency in urology at the hospital of University of Pennsylvania. Then at the same 
month when I started my residency, I was introduced in Tudorstown area and Tudorstown hospital. It's my professor took me up there, here, to the hospital, introduced me to the, to the board of the VIA, which is the Village Improvement Association, and uh, they accepted me and set up an interview for my wife and I to be interviewed by the member of VIA. And their philosophy at that time was, if someone wanted to come to the area, the family, the wife, would have to like to stay and remain in the area and start the practice in that area. Now, what year is this? This is 1961. And did you come and meet with the VIA? I came in, met with my with VIA with my wife, and we were interviewed at that time with the ladies of VIA on the board, Mrs. Sinkovich, Mrs. Sudan, Mrs. Nancy Perry, Mrs. Uh, Taylor, Carolyn Taylor, and Jane Elfman. First impression I get, the hospital was neat and clean, very organized and very disciplined and uh, by the board of VIA, which they were working as a volunteer and helping the system to be clean and neat and well disciplined. And coming from a big city, and I was so impressed how, how this, the board would be willing to give all those volunteer time to manage and care at the hospital. The, the, at that time, the VIA board managed and run the hospital. As a matter of fact, the first administrator, Mr. Merrick, Jerry Merrick, came at the same time. Before him, the VIA board was managing the hospital. And, uh, and the VIA board was made up of all women who owned and ran the first hospital in America? Yeah, there's, this is their only and the first hospital that was run by a group of ladies, which was Village Improvement Association in America. And we had uh, a start, the first start at the hospital was in Belmont and the Spruce, a two-story building. And uh, the operating room that where I might work would have to be done. We had two room for the operating room and I remember that there was a window air condition in those rooms. They Some, didn't have central air? They did not have in the operating room then yet. They were in the process to put central air in the hospital. And sometimes this air condition in summer did not work. And there were only three members. The Department of Surgery had a 30 member in that department. I believe now there are over 40 people in the Department of Surgery. 40 people? 40 people in the Department of Surgery. At that time, we had no anesthesiologists, and most of the major cases would, would, send to, would be sent to Philadelphia area. And we had, no, we had only one radiologist, and we had no orthopedic surgeon, ophthalmologist, or thoracic surgeon, none, only those three surgeons. And then we had one. ENT. And okay. who was, who was, I'm sorry, who was the radiologist at that time? Dr. Prickett, John Prickett, was the only radiologist in, in the hospital, which, uh, as I mentioned, the hospital only had one room, emergency room, and a couple room for radiology, x-ray that, at that time. When you came to Doylestown, did it have a staff urologist? No. They have, this is my professor, Occasionally, would come in to see a patient here and there and would go back in Philadelphia. He was my professor at the university. Therefore, on the first year, 1961, while I was doing residency, at the same time, I started to have some practice in urology in Dolston. How many beds, approximately, did the hospital have at that time? I believe at that time, the bed, if I recall, was number of, was 87 beds. And the new new bed at the hospital, 240 or some. Now they the, have over 240 it, beds. It, yeah, at the hospital. Okay. And because we had no no anesthesiologist, and I helped the first anesthesiologist uh, to come to Dorsan, Dr. Zanuzi, 
And then the department start to expand, and other doctors, some of them, with our help, they came in the saddle at Dolestown, and we had the first ortho orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Bryan, coming onto the staff, and is one of the very interesting area at the hospital at that time. We had no cardiologists. There was uh, Dr. Westcott, Bill William Westcott, and Dr. Fritz Roof. They were the only one that had an EK electrocardiogram machine, and they would come to the hospital in need to do an EKG on the patient. They would bring the EKG machine with them yeah. to the hospital? They would they own the EKG machine themselves and then bring it to the hospital with them. Could you tell us about the nursing staff when you first came to Doylestown Hospital? At that time, the nursing staff, we have, if I recall, we have five registered nurses, and the same, there was the, not more than four, four registered nurses, which one of them rotated at night to run to run the hospital. And the director of nursing at that time, Mrs. Pauline Young, was not only the director of nursing, she would run pharmacy at night. And our laboratory, we had only one laboratory technician, George Medara, which I recall very well because he became at one point my patient. He was the only technician we had at the hospital at that time. Okay. Could you tell us um, when you first came to Doylestown where your office was located? At the beginning, when I had the first year, I used the emergency room as my office space. And then I get to know Dr. Fritz Roof, which was on 61 South Tiny Street. He gave his office that I could come in to practice and use his office without charging me any rent. That was a few blocks from the hospital? That was a few blocks from the hospital. And our patient flow at that time would come in. They would, uh, there was no appointment at that time involved. The people would come in, write their name on the blackboard, and the guests are first come, guests are first. There was a blackboard in the waiting room that they in would the waiting come room. in? In the waiting room. And the interesting thing at that time was the county prisoner prison was on the same street, on Pine Street, and we had a number of patients which were at the prison at that time and would come to our office with a shackle on them and come to the office in the waiting room and sit down, chit chat with other patients. Dr. John Case was the warden. He did not like the idea that the prisoner would chit chat and socialize with other patients. And most of my patients at that time, they were coming from farming area and uh, they were uh, very easy to understand them because they love to be, take, be close, a certain, close to the doctors and become part of your family. And our office fee at that time was, uh, we charged five dollars for the office fee and a lot of time the farmers would come in if they had no money, they would bring some produce from their farm for the payment, for the office payment. At one time, I remember very well, one farmer came into the office, brought a live chicken with him as a payment, and I asked him, what do I do with this uh, chicken? <laughs> and he said to me, you're a surgeon, you know what to do. I said, it does not work that way. Why don't you take the chicken back and next time bring me some eggs? So he laughed, he liked the idea of taking his chicken back again to the farm. Did the majority of the patients have health insurance in those days? N n n there was no health insurance at that time because that was before the Medicare time. Few people, they had private insurance. They would uh, come into the office, otherwise, most of the patient was on cash basis. Whenever they had money, they would pay you. If they didn't have, they didn't pay you. There was not much billing involved. And you said an office visit was $5, five at that dollars. time? $5, yeah. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned that the operating room didn't have central air conditioning, and sometimes the doors would be propped open. 
Did something funny happen one time when the well, doors were propped open? Well, in the hospital at that time, the doors to the hospital were not sealed closed all the time. One morning that I came into the hospital, I saw a cat in in the hospital running around, and I notified the maintenance man, which only they had one maintenance man at that time. Chester Kubik was his name. He started to run around in the hospital. Eventually, after an hour looking, running, get a hold of the cat. Now they have the cat. They did not know what to do with the cat. Mrs. Nancy Perry, which was a member of the VIA board, said, well, I will ad adopt this cat, and I will take the cat home with me. That was a big, uh, big uh, relief for the people who love the cat and love the animals to be, have a nice home. And the cat walked into the operating room. It was coming in toward the operating room. This is where we have had to have seal off all the doors and windows that we could get the hold of the cat. That must have been funny. That was real funny. That was maybe that day was uh, the joke of the town. Maybe it was this cat maybe needs some medical treatment and maybe some surgical treatment. This is why I came in and looking uh, for the operating room at Doylestown Hospital. When you came to Doylestown Hospital in the early 60s, could you tell us about the relationship between the VIA and the Medical Society in terms of um, socializing and professionally what relationship they had? <coughs> At that time, is uh, the VIA board and the VIA, there was no contact in between the medical staff and the VIA board. And then when I become the president of medical staff, one of the first thing, with the help of Dr. Clifford Ladenslager, who was my mentor, who was, who was a tremendous amount of help to me, and Dr. Samuel Willard, and uh, Dr. Fritz Roof, and I organized the, the VIA board meet uh, with the doctors. And the plan was such that the VIA board uh, bake some cake or pie bring it to the hospital, and then we invite the doctors come once a month for the evening to have to join the VIA and eat the, the VIA pie. And that was name and call at that time, the pie party in, of the VIA. Did you also come to have um, a more formal event with the VIA and the medical staff? Then we started to develop that to have uh, the doctors at that time, because of the distance they were living, some were living in New Hope, Chalfon, Plumsteadville. At that time, the doctors did not have a way of socializing among themselves. We organized to have a medical staff uh, dinner, and then we invite the member of the VIA to come to join our medical staff dinner. Approximately what year was that? That year, the first meeting was when I was President of America's 1976. Okay. Now you mentioned that your first office was on Pine Street sharing with Dr. Roof after you left seeing patients at Doylestown Hospital. Uh, after Dr. Roof's office, where did you go from there? Then I went to North Main Street. At North Main Street, I stayed there from 1970 to 1992. My office was on North Main Street which is owned by Corfus Enterprise. Okay, and it's actually a law firm now. There's a law firm. And then from there, I moved to 401 South Main Street. Okay. And did you um, have the opportunity to serve on a bylaw committee for the hospital? Yeah, we were said, Dr. John Grip and Dr. Clifford Lonnesleiger and I, we were the one group the, forming the bylaw and the credential committee at the hospital that would be for the new doctors to come in. There would be a standard who could get on the staff and what distance the doctors have to be from the hospital when they were practicing. And one of the, one of the most important thing of our bylaw was anyone who wanted to practice at Dolstan Hospital has to be living in community and be within the short distance from the hospital if they're specialists. Now, it, back in those days, we didn't have cell phones and pagers and ways to get in touch with individuals 
other than telephones, regular landline telephones. Can you tell us some funny stories that you have about how the hospital was able to get in touch with you at different times? Yeah, every time you had, since you had no cell phone, other telephone is if you would go places, you have to leave the number behind and they would come with ambulance and get you. When I moved to my home at uh, Cherry Lane, there was, uh, there was no, the, when it was snow, they would not plow it on time. And when I needed to get down to the hospital, they would send, there was only two snowmobiles at that time, which owned by the hospital, by American Red Cross, that would send a snowmobile to come into the house to get you. And that was one way to get into the hospital. Occasionally, in, since I was on the ski patrol in Germany, I learned how to ski. Occasionally, I would ski from my house to the old hospital, which was on Belmont and Spruce. You would to, snow ski to work? Yes, yeah, snow ski to work. And one time, one of the doctors, I believe it was even in the paper, was uh, saying that instead of skiing, snow skiing, maybe we should get a camel now here to ride from your place to the hospital. Coming back from Middle East, they felt like maybe a camel is easier to run between my place into the hospital. Anyway. Was there a time that one of your daughters was on the phone for a long period of time and the hospital was trying to reach you? Yeah, it was. It was we only had one phone at the house and only on the living room the phone. And my kids get on the phone. If they could not contact us, they would send the police. The police was very much know, knew where my home is and how, how the phone is at my home is being used by my, by my children, and they would like to come over to my place to pick me up and take me to the hospital. That's how we got our second telephone line in the house. Yeah, of course, that's true. <laughs> uh, your wife, um, my mother, was also very involved in Doylestown Hospital. Could you tell us a little bit about her activities? So, my wife, from the first, when we came in, when we first moved into town, I should tell you, we rented a place in uh, Danborough, and we were paying $20 a month for the rental for that house. And at that time, is, uh, I had one of my child was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Hospital. My other children, two children, they were born at the old Dorstan Hospital and were, were delivered by Dr. Green. And I had, uh, in my wife is from the beginning of coming into town like to be involved with the hospital, with the com community, and therefore she get involved with the VIA, and she was one of the organizers and charter members of the hospital fashion show that they have every year, and the hospital designer's house. On top of it, my wife like to be of help to people in a needy country, organize a group of uh, medical staff wives to pick up and collect the sample drugs in a doctor's office that did not have use for it and send it overseas to countries like India, Pakistan, and maybe Iran for the, for the needy people in those countries. You were also very involved in community activities. Uh, one of the organizations that you were very active with was the Rotary Club. Can you tell us a little bit about your participation with the Rotary Club? Yeah, the, from the first time, first minute that I came to town, I wanted to be part of the town. And at that time, the best to be part of the town to be on with the people of the town. And I decided in 1962, I'm going to join the Rotary Club. Rotary Club at that time was taking one person from each field of expertise. And I get to know, um, know, join the Rotary. At some point, I become president of Rotary Club. And while I was on Rotary, Rotary would meet at County Krosky. County Krosky is uh, located on 611, is on Krosky area. And Mr. Walter County was the owner and the manager of Walter County restaurant. This is where Rotary was meeting. And he had, was restaurant at that time, 
was small, only the place that site is right now remained, that historical site, they did not have the new addition in, an, in, in, in the county Korski. And that building's currently a Dunkin' Donuts and a gas, gas station, station, is that correct? And I remember Mr. Walter County, the restaurant become so famous. He was chairman of American Restaurant Association. He was chairman of the Board of Trustee Penn, at Penn State. And, and the coach would uh, come frequently for dinner to Walter County. The Penn State well, football uh, coach? Yeah, Mr. Joe Faterno would come in, was close friend of Walter. And the restaurant to be get to known, and at one night, I remember that uh, the senator Hugh Scott, which was senator, federal senator from the state of Pennsylvania, they came in to dinner at Walter's restaurant. Walter was standing by, Mr. Wal Michael Conti, a uh, Joe Conti, at that time they were working with their dad. Mike run to senator. Scott and say to him, Mr. Scott, your table is ready. Walter did hear that rush and said to Michael, Michael, that's not you, that's not you are calling. You call it Senator Scott, your dinner is ready. That was a debate at that time, night, how Walter liked to have discipline, have to be people known who is coming to visit his, res his restaurant. How would Walter Conti greet people when they came into his restaurant? He was always standing by the door and very tall, good looking, and always dressed very well. And he knew everybody by their first name. And he would uh, shake hands with everyone and like to welcome everyone that uh, coming to the restaurant from all distance. People come from New York, maybe sometimes from all over America because he was well known that would come to his restaurant for dinner. And he would announce them then as they were coming in? He would announce them by name and announce them that they are here for dinner at our restaurant. Now, did the Rotary Club get involved in some fundraising events for Doyle Sun Hospital? The Rotary Club was the first uh, job that the Rotary had did. And I was at that time president of the club. We had uh, opened the March of Time and brought the March of Time to Central Box area and helped the hospital, which every year, the summertime in June, the hospital had June Fair, which was involved inviting the community to come in to have, uh, to have a place for the, for the children and to have one of the best barbecue uh, set up, which the Rotary Club participate to prepare and uh, help for fundraising with the hospital. Every year, two, two kids from Central Box area would go as an exchange student to one of the European country, and then they would invite two students from, from the country, European country to come in to go to CB East or CB West. That is another thing the Rotary was involved to do for the community and for international understanding among the people. I become involved with the Boy Scout of America and had become reached the executive level on the Boy Scout of America. And we were planning in 1978 to take a jamboree group of 15,000 Scouts from America to Iran. At that time, my father-in-law was involved in the parliament of Iran and Shah of Iran liked to see the Scots from America to come to Iran for Jamboree. We were in the process to do that. Then the revolution of Iran 1979 took place. We could not do that. So the Scots, I get involved with the Scots, uh, going to the Camp Nadink, which is the Scott, Boy Scout and Rotary Club running it and uh, attending a lot of the meetings, got to get together and uh, helping the young children, young kids at a school system in, uh, in here in Central Bucks County area. Okay. Now you have the opportunity in your medical practice to treat some famous people, is that true? Correct. Could you tell us about One that? One of the famous patients we had at the old Dolstan Hospital were Mr. James Michener. He came into the hospital 
for some cardiovascular, some heart problem. We get involved with his management, and he was so well known. Doctors from all over the country, from John Hopkins Mayo Clinic, they all would fly to come to see and James Michener. And I myself, at that time, beside I mean, James Michener, but one of the first people taking care of AIDS patients in, in the area. And uh, You were one of the first doctors who was willing to treat AIDS patients in this area? Correct, yeah. Could you give us a, your, your reflections of downtown Doylestown when you came to Doylestown? When I came, I liked to walk in town and meet the people in town. Almost every day when I was walking in town, especially on a weekend, I would see Mr. John, Don Atkinson, which was the mayor, and Joe Kenny when they had the Kenny News Agency, and Mr. Milton Rutherford, which had the photography shop. They would be on, on the corner of State and Main Street talking to each other and greeting the people in town. And there's people that were known in town, and they knew everybody in town who would come and they greet them. And then across the street, we had the only pharmacy in town. Weisbart was the only pharmacy. And Mr. Weisbart occasionally would come join them at the same time in debate and discussing. And most of their aim and plan was the town would be clean and safe and people know each other that they are part of the community. If they have, if there are any help, they could help each other and help other people to come to town. Uh, besides you and your family, were there many foreign-born uh, individuals living in Doylestown in the early 1960s? Mm, no, I don't know anyone except the people that I helped to come down to, except the people that came to town, like Dr. Zanuzzi and the people like Dr. Wackhorn. And they came after you? They came after me, yeah. So how were you received as um, really a foreigner coming to Doylestown? The people were very... The people of town, they were very cordial, and they receive you very well, and they like to be part of your, you become part of the uh, community. For that reason, we become very involved socially and uh, professionally, meeting a lot of we met nice people in town, like uh, beside Dr. Lawton Stoggers' family and Dr. Willard and other doctors in town. We met the family of uh, Bill Eastman family, Bill Goldman family, and, and the Jake Reed at that time, and Jack Elfman family we met, and Bill Power, who eventually became a judge. And Bill Valamon was another famous attorney in town, and we become social friends and going to each other's wedding and other, it, others activity and we, our family enjoyed to be having a tremendous amount of friend and contact and relationship with other people in, in community. That's why we like about the town. They were very, they received you well and they were part of you and they were all your friends. They all called each other by first name and that was the best part of your life that you were accepted and well received in town by those people. Now, the hospital that you came to first on um, Pine Street was actually the second Doylestown Hospital. Is that correct? There was a uh, hospital that pre... The Belmont, uh, you mean at... The school? Belmont, excuse me. Yes, that was actually Doylestown's second hospital, right? Yeah, the first hospital, I do not remember they had, what setup they had, much did not know. When I came in, I only get involved with the second hospital. As you know, there's been a lot of debate recently about a new courthouse being built in downtown Doylestown. During your career, there was a lot of debate at some point about building a new Doylestown hospital. Is that correct? Correct. Could I you get, tell us about that? I get very much involved. I get to know Dr. James Work, which was president of Delaware Valley College. And uh, I get to know him through other doctors and become friend. And at some point, I was getting some, buying some land from him. And with this, I was in contact with him. The hospital board in, uh, with uh, Jerry Merrick, 
would be an administrator at 1970, start to look to get a land that they wanted to move out of town, out of the borough. They need more space. Were there some people who wanted the hospital to stay in the center of town? Yeah, there, at that time there was debate between some of the doctors and some of the VIA board that maybe we could purchase more houses, more building, and expand at the location where we are. And the debate get bigger, and there was then understanding between the doctors and the VIA that we need more room. The medical staff was expanding, getting larger, bigger, more doctors, more specialists. So they decided to go in to get the land done where the, the location is on 202 right now. Sounds like an argument that we just had about the local courthouse. Yeah. And so what, what finally happened? This, and they decide when, when you want it, any community is growing, getting larger, and more people need your service, you cannot expand in the location. The access to the hospital at that time at Belmont Avenue was not that good because there was a lot of traffic coming to town and the communication in town was getting crowded more and having the courthouse in the middle of town. Then finally they decided they better go purchase that land and move out, out of and the town. And do you recall um, how much Dr. Work sold that land to Doylestown Hospital for? It was the number of dollars was never known public. Okay. The amount of it was not public. The word talk about it was not that much. Dr. Work was very generous and he was very, very good to the hospital. So the talk around town was that he sold it for far less than the market value? Mm, correct. That's what, okay. correct, yeah. And what year did Doylestown Hospital then move to that? 1976. I have to tell you this is about the interesting part. We used to have a man by the name of Lou Gossip. He was the designer for Hollywood. And one night he was at the coming in to have dinner at the Plumstead Bill Inn. And I believe he had one or two drinks too much. He stood in the middle of the street and directing the traffic, claiming maybe his, uh, since it was Christmas Eve, I believe if I recall, his uh, Jesus Christ and a car hit him. He became a patient at the Adolson Hospital. When we were moving the patient, we had only a few patients at the hospital. When we moved the old hospital to new hospital, they had a big car, this limo decorated with his name, and he was sitting in that car moving the whole hospital, saying my power is as such, I move a place from one place to another place. There was talk of town about Mr. Lou Gossip. Okay, so when the new hospital opened, what year was that? 1976. How many oper operating rooms did the new hospital have? The new hospital, I don't know the exact number because they add more and more, but from two operating rooms, we had most likely we have about eight or ten operating rooms right now. In, when I was chairman of the Department of Surgery, 1980, 81, there was no cases sent to Philadelphia anymore. We would service only maybe transplant cases because we had all the cases that we could do, we could, we could do it at Dolson Hospital, including neurosurgery, all the major cases. No cases was sent to Philadelphia anymore. Did you also have the opportunity to uh, get involved in politics in Doylestown? Well, since I was a member of community, I wanted to be with the people and with the community. I get involved in, uh, in, in since I was involved, deeply involved in practice of medicine and progress of medicine, I get involved with one, one of the party in town. Um, eventually, one, one job that was offered to me, I was appointed by Governor Schaefer to go to Harrisburg to be part of the Commissioner of Health. And at that time, I became the chairman of osteopathic section of the Commissioner of Health. And we were the one integrating the osteopathic hospital and doctors to allopathic to medical hospital. Before that, no osteopathic doctors could get on the staff at medical hospital. And we were able to get theirs 
two entities together that could provide the care for their patients the best they know how. Okay. Were you also involved with Bucks County Community College? I become, when Bucks County Community College become, Dr. Rollins was the first president of Bucks County Community College. And at that time, we had shortage of nurses. And talking to Dr. Rollins and being involved on a state level, and they were able to bring, we were able to bring a nursing program to Bucks County Community College, which is a very successful program at the college right now. Okay. And your wife also graduated from Bucks County Community College? Yeah. She, my wife, came in down. She, she did not finish all her education in Iran. She finished her schooling system, including going to Bucks County Community College. The most fun was I was a board of trustee. When she graduated, I was the one handed out her diploma to her. That was fun for both of us. Okay. Your children um, also went to school in Doylestown, is that correct? Yes, yeah, my children were, all my three children went to Central Box School System, and my oldest daughter, Mita, is working right now at the courthouse, and then my second daughter, Mina, which went to the law school at Georgetown and is a lawyer working for Justice Department. And so my youngest daughter, Tina, went, went to Central Park School System and went to Temple Law School, which is practicing law in town. Well, it's been my pleasure having this opportunity to interview you for the Doylestown Historical Society. Uh, I'm glad that the society was able to have this opportunity to record your recollections of Doylestown and of the medical community in, starting in the early 1960s and beyond. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank the Doylestown Historical Society and the president of the society, Judge Ludwig. And I wanted to thank the community to receiving me coming from 8,000 miles to be settling down in this town with those people who helped me and took care of us with the family. And we enjoyed all those years. And I'm very happy that I came to this town and become part of this community and received by this community. And thank you very, very much.